What's up, replay viewers? Welcome to episode three of the Mental Health Hour. We are going to be talking about significant loss tonight. I hope my connection doesn't. Who's that? Is that? Oh, it's Hannah. Hang on here. I can't see the comments. Let me try adjusting this. Hmm, that's weird. Well, thank you for the high award there, Hannah. I can see just part of the messages. What's going on tonight? Today, tonight? I guess wherever you are, it depends. Oh, here we go. Forty. Well, I haven't even said anything yet. <laughs> all right, I just got set up with the comments here. They were all off to the side. I couldn't see anything. Anyway, welcome, 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 everybody. We'll get started with uh, significant loss tonight. Um, this I picked this topic for this week um, because it's been at the forefront of basically my whole week. Um, I was on Lucia's broadcast on Wednesday um, telling my story for her viewers. Um, she did a little interview Q&A. Um, and that went really well. Uh, we touched on significant loss a little bit in there. Um, but I also... Oh! Uh, I also... Um, hit on it when I shared um, for those of you that don't know I picked up my one year chip with Alcoholics Anonymous this Wednesday uh, so I had to do a little half hour share in the meeting about you know what I what my year has been like experience strength and hope um, and I realized that significant loss has played such a huge role in this entire experience uh, from beginning to end or from beginning to now and continuing um, and so it's a it's a good topic it doesn't get talked about much uh, the reason I say significant loss is because usually whenever we're talking about loss or grieving in some sort of way uh, everybody immediately thinks the ultimate of death. Um, and I apologize. I say I'm a little blurry. Uh, it's raining here. I don't know if that has something to do with it, but hopefully it'll straighten out. It says I got good bars of service here. So. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Or am I choppy? Let me know. Let's see if we can make an adjustment. Yep. Hey, Lucia. Welcome, welcome. Connection's great. Awesome. Okay, it's just blurry on my end. That's all right. I don't need to look at myself anyway. So anyway, yes, yeah, significant loss and grieving and the whole process. Um, it's not just death. I mean... You know, there's the five uh, stages of grief, the denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Um, I was taught five. Some people say there's seven now. That may be, um, you know, as time goes on, there might be 10, 12, 15. But I know the five stages of grief. Um, and we hit those without even knowing it on a regular basis. Um, that's something I learned 
on my journey here. Uh, Cause I was one of the ones that believed that, you know, death was, we grieve death and that's it. And uh, thank you, Lucia. Um, but learning down at the center, um, the rehab center I went to, that uh, we can grieve everything from, you know, from death all the way down to a road closure, you know, on your way to work that you drive every day. Um, something that simple can throw a wrench in your life. Um, and you know, you know, that way to work, you enjoy that That's part of your morning routine and now it's gone. Um, and you might not feel the depression, the denial, the bargaining, but your body still goes through it. Your brain still runs through that. Like, man, I wish I could. Oh my God. Thank you for the monthly sponsorship. Lucia, I appreciate you. Um, it's a crazy thing to think about, but you, your brain still goes in and out of those five stages of grief on even small stuff, whether you're aware of it or not. Um, man, I'd give anything if they just opened that road again or there's some bargaining or you're angry about it, um, you know, until finally you accept the fact that that's the way it is right now. And we did learn about something called radical acceptance. That's going to get its own show. It's a great topic. Um, radical acceptance, that just breaks down to basically uh, it is what it is. Um, but I'll do a whole episode on that because that, there's a lot to talk about with radical acceptance. And I'm not sure that radical acceptance really applies in grieving um, or significant loss. Um, if you're grieving the loss of a loved one, that's you, you're not going to tell somebody it is what it is, man. <laughs> I mean, I think it has its place, and uh, I don't think significant loss is so much uh, a great place for radical acceptance. I think it's a gradual acceptance when we get into into significant loss. Um, so the biggest thing is understanding. Um, that your body is, uh, your brain needs to go through these five stages of grief, even if it's the small stuff. And learning more about that, just like anything else in this mental health world, is really what's going to help you get through. Um, so the first thing's first. I mean, pain is real. I mean, Let's take the loss of a loved one. That pain is so real and it's not going to go away. You're going to have to cope in your own way. Um, so, I mean, first things first, like I said, you got to acknowledge that. You got to acknowledge that pain. And, you know, everybody deals with a significant loss differently. Um, I know I'm not saying anything mind blowing yet, but uh, sometimes just these little refreshers is what helps us um, along these, these, these paths we, we get faced with. Um, and the reason I say I should have started with the reason I called or that we say significant loss. Bo, thank you for the super heart. Much appreciated. Um, the reason we say significant loss is because it's significant to you. Um, you know, take something small, maybe uh, the loss of, I don't know, your, your favorite candy bar is no longer to be made. And this candy bar was a big part of your life. You love this candy bar and they no longer make it now. You have to grieve that loss. Um, and that might be significant to you where I'm like, I could care less about that candy bar. That's what I mean by it's significant to you. You know what I mean? 
Um, so, I mean, keep that in mind when you're, because also we can talk about how to deal with somebody that's experiencing a significant loss um, a little later on, but keep that in mind when you are talking with somebody uh, or helping them along their travels, um, what's significant to them might not be so significant to you, but clearly it's got them distraught, you know. Um, yeah. So that's just a little, I guess, disclaimer. Um, we see, and we can grieve anything, not only a physical loss. Absolutely, Alicia. That's what I was saying. Um, it can be anything, and you can grieve it without even knowing it, like involuntary, um, or you're just not as aware of it because the pain isn't maybe as real as losing a loved one. Um, yeah, so everybody copes differently. Um, one of the biggest things I wanted to stress was that something uh, major like the loss of a loved one or, uh, I don't know, a divorce. I know that was huge for me. My divorce really screwed me up. Um, it was as if I had lost somebody to death. Um, isolation is normal in the beginning. You know, when it's fresh, you're going to isolate. You're going to not want to see anybody. That's completely normal. It's when we let it become excessive. Like two months later, we're still not taking phone calls and locked away in our house. Um, that that's going to start to become a problem. Um, there, there is a place and time for isolation. Uh, you do need some time to take it in. You need time to, you know, what, what's the word? Uh, need time to process. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so, and you have to do that on your own. You know, you have to take a moment away from everybody maybe a day or two, isolate if you must, you know, process what's happened and then start the process of healing um, to the best of your abilities. Like we'll get into some stuff that I like to do. Um, and, I, you know, if you guys have anything, please throw it up in the comments. Um, my, my divorce sent me off the deep end, which for me is very deep. <laughs> Bo, I feel you. I was right there with you. My divorce is probably what sent me to rehab because everything just got way worse with my drinking and, and everything. I mean, the drinking was already a problem, but this was like the, uh, you know, straw that broke the camel's back, I guess. Um, so... What do we do when we're mourning or when we're experiencing significant loss? I'll throw the first one out there and a huge disclaimer on this. I'm not an advocate for this. Um, they say getting out there and exercising is uh you know, world changing for your mental health. And that may be the case for some. I don't enjoy exercising when I'm happy. So certainly not gonna be the first one to be going for a jog, but I do like riding a bicycle. So, I mean, there's that. Different kinds of exercise. I always think of people going out for a jog and getting that runner's high adrenaline endorphins all that good stuff that's not my thing i when i turned 30 i stopped jogging and i got rid of facebook and i've been happy for four years <laughs> well happier <laughs> also rehab that helped too 
Um, so exercise, getting out for a walk, maybe. I mean, I'm throwing that one out there because it works for some people. Even It even still allows you to kind of isolate if you feel like you want to, if you go out for a walk by yourself. Um, but again, I'm not advocating isolation as a long-term fix here. Uh, it's, I was just merely pointing out that it's completely normal to isolate in the beginning. So you have time to process whatever has happened in your life by yourself without a thousand people hovering around you. Um, everybody needs, you know, just a little time and that's normal. Um, and I also have to throw out there since I'm the AA guy that we don't want to get into alcohol and drugs to mask the problem. That's another thing that I was personally guilty of. Um, I already drank enough as it was um, to mask all this depression I was carrying around when, when a significant loss happened, it was just even more. And then was drinking even enough. What else could I find? Not that I was ever able to find anything, but the thought was there. Um, nor would I do it because I don't want to lose my job. And uh, they could test me at any time. And, you know, like I said, I, I always kept the alcohol boundary with work. I don't know how, but I did. Um, and I'm not going to do anything else down those lines. Um, what else do we got here? Uh, so exercising and biking, I, I brought that up. Uh, but there's other enjoyable activities that you can get out and do. Um, what makes you happy? What what makes you happy? Get out and do what makes you happy, even if it's something inside. Uh, you know, just get out of bed, go downstairs and watch TV, be a part of the family. Slowly start to incorporate back in. Slowly start to incorporate back outside into the real world. You know, there's nothing better when I'm feeling a little down than to be with my friends, um, be with my family. Um, even getting on here uh, on HAPS and just popping into somebody's broadcast and joining the comment train with the likes of Bo <laughs> and uh, just laughing it up. These are small little things that are enjoyable activities that can kind of turn things around um, slowly. It's a process. Um, there was a quote. It, I, it wasn't a quote, but it was a um, like a little passage that we read down when I was at the center. And I forget who to give credit to this for, but it really resonated with me a lot. Um, I'll have to look it up at some point in time because um, I don't, I don't want to Google on here and next, next thing I know I'm kicked off the broadcast or something. <laughs> I'll look on my phone, but uh, it's that uh, grief comes, grief comes in and out like the waves of an ocean. You know, like, and, and you have to ride that wave. Um, you have to be okay with it. You ride the wave because as soon as it crashes down, it's going to come back in, you know? So that made a lot of sense to me. Uh, I know I'm not doing it any justice and I'm pulling it from, you know, almost a year ago now, uh, out of the memory bank. But, uh, well, see you later there, Di. Um, yeah, ride the wave. It kind of allows for that acceptance. Does that make sense? Um, did I explain that correctly? I feel like I really butchered it, but I like the thought. It's, it's one of those things that 
wow, I never put it quite like that. That makes a lot of sense. And accepting grief will help you accept the loss and move forward. I don't know. I liked that one. Um, what do we got for comments? Grief has no expiration date. That's very true. I exercise my fists in bar fights. Not proud of it. Bo. Oh boy, Bo. Well, I mean, that is a, that is an outlet for some, you know, the, the bar fight or letting out that anger. It is a part of the five stages of grief. Maybe punch a wall. <laughs> I don't want to see anybody go to jail. Um, but yeah, um, this topic alone was huge to me down at the center, learning all about how, how we do, you know, grieve a little bit, you know, getting a little bit more knowledge on the, on the topic. Um, and, and what we grieve and how we do it. And it just really spoke to me. Um, and I spoke on it, like I said, um, at my AA meeting when I picked up my chip. And it was a big part of understanding me. You know, I mentioned in an earlier broadcast that you can't, well, for me at least, I don't want to say it's for everyone, but I, I feel like it applies. You can't take the first steps forward in your recovery, whatever it may be, uh, without learning what's going on inside you first. Once you can take in and understand how your body is responding to any given event or how it responds differently to a substance like alcohol. Like I thought my body was acting normal because it's all I knew. And I thought the guys I was drinking with were just lightweights. But what, what's wrong with you? I mean, you can't keep up. And it took somebody down at the center to finally put it into my head that um, those people are all acting the same because that's the normal response. You're the one that's not responding normally to it. You shouldn't not get hangovers. You shouldn't not get sick. You shouldn't, you know, etc. cetera. Um, you shouldn't be able to throw back 25 beers. Um, but that's off topic. I don't know, is it? Let's see. I'm looking through some of my notes from from down there. I took I took a lot of notes. What's, yeah, the jail time cured me of it. <laughs> How long were you there, Bo? How long were you inside the clink? Is that rude to ask? I guess not. You're you're being open about it. Um, what else? Oh, therapy, of course. Um, therapy as a whole, counseling, group counseling, 60 days, 60 days inside. Um, there you go, Hannah. I, I, I did it for you. <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Oh, you threw me off. Oh, therapy. Therapy as a whole, I, I always laughed at it. Uh, I don't want to go sit and tell somebody about my day or anything about my life. Um, it's none of their damn business. I can handle this myself. I just need to be alone and whatever. You know, I had every excuse until I actually sat down with somebody. I think it was honestly 
the group counseling that got me so on board with therapy as a whole. Um, I mentioned this in Lucia's broadcast on Wednesday. Um, if you haven't tried group therapy, that is the way to go. Um, it, it just, there is nothing better. There's nothing better to reinforce that you're not alone than to have five other people with the exact same thing you're going through in the room with you talking about it. Um, and, and to, and for you, when it's your turn to start sharing something, to look up and see the other five people like, uh-huh. Yep. Like, wow. <laughs> you feel this way too? So what we got here, I had to put a dick in my mouth today. I faked swallowed. So there is a God. Well, I'm sorry. I don't know. I heard a couple of guys pretty bad, and the judge didn't think a former frogman should be out there doing that kind of shit. He was right. There you go, Bo. I needed your time. Did you get out early, or did you do the full 60? Uh-oh, our friend got muted. Oh. You got out early. That's good. So let me ask you this, Bo. Um, uh, when you went inside, would you say that you experienced a significant loss of your free will or freedom? And then, bonus question, when you left jail, did you experience significant loss coming back out in the real world? It's weird how it works. It... Why don't you come on up? You want to tell us? I'll invite, I'll invite anybody in. Just say the word. So... Let's talk about the flip side while Bo answers me, if he so pleases. Um, let's talk about dealing with a friend who's experiencing significant loss, because oftentimes we find ourselves in this position as well. Um, I know more often than not, I seem to be in a position where I'm helping somebody now than feeling the grief myself. Does that make sense? Um, big loss of freedom, but when I got out, it was just happiness and promising myself I ain't doing that again. Uh, I bet, I bet so. Um, the, the reason I asked um, is, and. You know, I'm not comparing jail to rehab, but I went through a significant loss going to rehab. Um, I, I was losing my former life. Uh, I was losing what I thought was my best friend, alcohol. Um, I was losing some dietary things because I've screwed up my pancreas and liver, um, et cetera. But then 44 days later, when it's time to come home and graduate rehab, I found myself experiencing loss again because I enjoyed my time there. Not that you would enjoy your time in jail, uh, but you know what I mean? That's why I was asking. Um, it just, it's one of those things where it's crazy how life works sometimes. Feel loss going in and then feel loss coming out again. But, um, on to dealing with folks. Uh, I find in my personal experiences, because I have a lot of friends that, especially since I got back, I've, I've thrown myself into this, this work, this service work, this, please come talk to me, peer support. I'm here. 
Um, and, you know, I want to be that guy because I know I got so bad because I didn't really feel like I had an avenue to go down, which is what I, that's, I'm trying to provide just one more avenue for somebody, whether it be this broadcast or whether it be the peer support group that I lead uh, with the fire department or um, AA, et cetera. Piano man in the house. Thank you for the apps hug. Good to see you. Are you doing the crossword later? I'm still stuck. I am, uh, I think I'm about uh, an hour and 34 minutes into it and I've just about thrown my phone. Um, Piano Man is experiencing significant loss right now because Blaine has left to go home. So I'm sure he is going through this, the five stages of grief. Hopefully Blaine makes it home safe. And uh, I think right before I got on, oh, great, 930. I think right before I got on, uh, he was broadcasting from the plane. So so anyway, we'll go to uh, being there for somebody. Um, I like to just listen. Um, one of the biggest things I heard uh, was don't, um, what's the word? Don't tell them everything that they're saying is not true. Like that if they're saying, you know, even if they're saying crazy stuff, like I failed, I'm a, I'm a failure, um, this, that, and the other, you don't want to say you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And here's why, because that is a very dismissive approach. And it's true. Cause I, I, I found myself feeling dismissed at times by everybody just telling me you're wrong. Um, so, I mean, you want to listen to them and you want to, you don't want to reinforce that they're a failure, but you know how to just kind of, you know, you, you don't want to, what am I trying to say here? I know you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm having trouble putting it into words. Um, but just don't be dismissive. It's, it's rude. Um, it doesn't help. Even though I, it, it feels like you're trying to help. Nobody is taking that away. I know because I was guilty of it too. I did it all the time. No, that's not true. That's not true. Um, I didn't realize I was doing some harm rather than some good there. I hear you. I see you goes a long way. Exactly. Lucia. Perfect. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just don't be dismissive. Listen to them. Um, if you have the means, you can link them to an appropriate uh, route of travel. Like myself now, coming back from rehab and what have you, I have a multitude of uh, therapists or therapy options, group therapy options, um, outpatient stuff through the center. Um, trauma specialty therapy. Uh, I have a gauntlet of uh, things that I can personally recommend for a firefighter that's in need. Um, if, if somebody comes to me at one of our peer support meetings and they're just having a really hard time with a call that might have been two years ago and they're still hanging on to it because that traumatic brain it's always in the now. When you experience trauma, um, your right and left brain aren't communicating and it's not able to be time stamped and filed away as a good memory uh, or anything of the such. It just stays right in the now. That's why it always feels like yesterday. Um, but um, if I, if I, have a firefighter approach me with something like that. I know I can link him to this trauma specialist group um, that does wonders, amazing work. 
um, they really like get in there <laughs> and root around. We call them um, mind ninjas. They're, they're incredible. They can link things. You, you just tell them a story and they're just writing stuff down on the board. <coughs> Excuse me. They're just writing notes down on the board of things that you're saying. And then they're making all kinds of connections. And well, have you ever thought about it this way? And well, this might link back to your childhood because you mentioned this several times. And it's just like, holy shit. But it's incredible work because you leave that session feeling like, like I, I went through it with my divorce. I processed my divorce through trauma, specialized trauma therapy. Um, and I left out of there with a reframed mindset on. So basically, I, I went in thinking I was a failure. My marriage failed because of me. You know, I, I don't deserve anything good. Um, I don't deserve to be married again. I don't deserve happiness. I'm a failure. And I, I processed through all that. I, I spilled my guts to this guy. He made all these connections, went through a line of Socratic questioning and reframed my original thought, which was filled with cognitive distortions. That's another episode, cognitive distortions. Um, and we reframed it into my divorce was not a failure. It was an unsuccessful marriage. And I'm only 50% responsible for 100% of it. Um, it takes two to tango. And I was putting everything on me. Now, granted, I was the one that was the, uh, the drunk. I was, you know, never home hardly because if I wasn't at work for 24 hours, then I was at a bar or something, et cetera, et cetera. But there, it is, there is something to it. Um, there was no communication from her on, on this end of things that we were even heading down that path, et cetera. So, I mean, I'm only responsible for 50% of 100% of it. Hold on. I said that wrong. I'm only responsible for 100% of 50% of it. Switch it. Um, same thing. You get the, you get the message. Um, people want to feel validated. Absolutely. That, yep, exactly. That is um, going back to not being dismissive. Yes. Or minimize what they're sharing, especially if, they're opening up about something really personal. Yes, exactly. That this is clearly bothering them. And like I said at the beginning, significant loss is called significant loss because it's significant to you. It's not significant to usually the person that's your best friend or whatever, whoever's going to be by your side getting you through this. Um, grief comes in many forms. And we always migrate towards one or two specific people in our times of need. Um, at least I found myself doing that. You know, I've got, I do have a new wife now. I'm remarried. Um, it will be married for a year in October. Um, so everything's going really well with that. Oh, and that was the other thing. Um, we kind of reframed um the only responsible for 100 percent of 50 percent of it and um it was unsuccessful marriage uh and it allowed me to be successful in this marriage uh i know what i did i know where i erred and i know what not to do now <laughs> if that, i mean quite plainly um but yeah it, it set me up for success for this marriage so all in all we framed it into somewhat of a good thing which that's pretty much the uh i mean the the mind ninjas of of the trauma clinicians 
they'll be the first to tell you this is not wizardry this is not magic this is this is not mind ninjaing it's a process that we do for any traumatic or significant loss we run you through the same socratic questioning we take your cognitive distortions we flip flop it and we look at it from a different angle and you know i wasn't able to do that myself um I don't think a lot of people can. I mean, it did take sitting down and talking this this stuff out, um, you know, to with the right person, I guess, with the right clinician. Um, and that's a new word I learned. Clinician. They they they're not therapists anymore. They're clinicians. So maybe we'll see that on the crossword. Clinician. Remember that word. Um, anyway, am I caught up on comments? I'm, I feel like I'm really bad at the comments part of things. Plus, I don't know how to do how you guys do that. Um, how do you do that? Present on screen? Did that do it? Oh, there it is. No. Nope. Presenting. I think I just screwed everything up. There it is. Hey, I'm getting better at this. You read comments and answer them. You're doing good. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. It does fill some time because I feel like I'm already done talking about significant loss and we still got 15 minutes in the mental health hour. Oh, so being there for somebody but not being overbearing, that's also huge. Um, right alongside not not dismissing their feelings. We don't want to overcrowd. We don't want to overbear. Um, usually, you know, I've found that, like I said, that you, you have your, you have your special people in your life that you normally migrate to when times are rough. Um, if you're that person for somebody, you don't even have to be there sometimes they'll come knocking at your door so i mean if they're in a time of that isolating time i definitely i don't try and get involved i like i said you, you got to take time to process for yourself if i see that they're isolating for a extended period of time um hello from calgary dr john i'm glad you hopped on I have not forgot about you. Uh, I have been busy at work. I will answer your email. I did read your email. Um, I will send you back an email tonight, as soon as I'm done on here, before the crossword. I got to finish that crossword. It's bothering me. Um, well, Wilson's going to finish it for me. I'm just going to watch. But yes, Dr. John, I got to write a note. Dr. John. No problem. I visited with one of your colleagues today. Who's that? A fellow fireman, firewoman, firefighter. Um, where are we? Oh. Don't be overbearing. Um, yeah, they'll come. Or if I see somebody isolating for an extended period of time, I might step in a little bit and be like, look, um, I know this is rough or whatever the case may be, especially if it's like the loss of a loved one. Um, I'm still here. You know, I, I'll just keep kind of trying to insert myself a little bit more at a time but without trying to wedge myself into their life. They'll come when they're ready. Um, you know, everybody takes their own amount of time. And I feel like we know if it's, I feel like we'll know if it's an issue with how long they're taking to grieve. Um, like I said, if they're two months, um, 
nobody's seen them for two months and they're they're just locked in their own house yeah uh, let's do an intervention kind of thing um, but along the lines of you want to kind of let them come to you by the way super big disclaimer I'm not a therapist I'm not a trained psychologist these are my observations from my own recovery and I'm just opening conversation about it. I would love to hear from you guys and what you guys do, um, et cetera. I stake no claim as a therapist. I'm just offering some advice or let's chat kind of stuff. Clinician, thank you, Bo. Thank you. I see, I did it. I just did it. Yes, best kind since you went through it. <laughs> thank you. Yes, uh, that's part of the, the uh, like I was telling you earlier, the, the 12 steps of AA, the very last step. Having had a spiritual awakening, we now go forth and help others on their road to recovery. Um, that's all I'm doing here sharing my experience, strength, and hope um, in the hopes that it helps somebody else along their road. Um, I'm not telling you what you should do. I'm not telling you. These are just merely observations. I feel like I should say that, though, you know. I, I, although I guess if Dr. John isn't yelling at me, then we should be all right. <laughs> um, yeah. So that is... Really, I mean, that's all I had on this topic for tonight. I Just all I had jotted down from my notes. <coughs> Excuse me. Did anybody have any questions or want to discuss anything um, that I touched on? I'd be more than happy to field questions, invite somebody in. I'd love to try that. I've never done that before. Piano Man, you, you're... You're a regular on here kind of guy. Bo, you want to come say hi? What is this? Maths are hard. Lucia, actually, she wants to do one of her uh, episodes of Be Kind to Your Mind on the grieving process. I didn't really get much into it. I mean, we know the denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But other than that, um, I'm on my iPhone. It heats up to like 500 Kelvin. <laughs> okay. I assume... All I would do is just hit invite people and then type you in. I'll figure it out. I'm actually going to do an episode here with Gemma. Um, I don't know if you, I know some of you know Jenna, Gemma, but uh, she's going to come on and we're going to kind of do a episode together. She got talking to me after my broadcast with Lucia and uh, wanted to do something uh, kind of similar, but she's big into this stuff as well and, and wants to help. And I said, absolutely. Um, Bo says he'll come up next week. Uh, cool. Oh, next week. Next week, uh, I'm going to try and do it on Saturday as, as usual. Um, but I have to work a rare Saturday. So I will be at the fire station and I could get a call at any minute, but we'll try. And I might have to do it on my iPhone. Ah, I guess I could bring my laptop. We'll see. I swear a lot. So be ready. Hey, so do I though. So do I, but somehow I'm able to not swear so much here. I don't know. It's weird because, you know, I'll be honest, like, 
it's, it, I guess it's that firehouse life, you know, fuck isn't even a word. It's a comma. Lost. I guess we can recap. How about that? We'll recap before we end um, our significant loss episode. Uh, loss is more than just death. That was a big thing. Um, and yeah, one one of the biggest takeaways is to um, realize that your body is or your brain is grieving loss, whether you realize it or not. It, it could be something small. Um, like I, I used the example of a road closure earlier. You, you might not realize it, but you are in some way, shape or form going through denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance over this road closure. Um, it doesn't always have to be as big as death um, for, for you to experience the grief. Um, get back to a normal routine as quickly as you can. There's nothing better than being out there with your colleagues, with your friends, with your family. Um, maybe change environs a little bit. Um, like, especially if the environment that would be normal routine would be super triggering um, of, of the event that caused significant loss. Obviously you don't want to put yourself in a triggering position when you're just getting back out there but uh you, yeah you can change up the environment a little bit um you know in one way or the other um be mindful of the triggers uh we all have them we all have significant loss we all grieve just be mindful of your pain be mindful of the grieving process accept the grieving process and go with it like the waves. Um, it, it comes in and out and you ride the wave. Um, I also mentioned radical acceptance being it is what it is. I said, I don't, I don't really feel like that applies in, in the, uh, the grieving process for significant loss. Um, use of non -ex expletives works too. I swear. I don't I swear like a sailor because I was a sailor. Well, there you go. Well, then, I mean, that's your that's your free pass, right? I swear like a fireman. Firefighter, sorry. Firefighter. Um, and the pain. The pain is real. Learn more about it. There's uh, nothing quite like educating yourself on what we don't know that helps so in such a different way. And until you get out there and try it, you won't know what I'm talking about. Like I, I just, I constantly am educating myself further on, on all this mental health stuff because now I actually find it interesting uh, now that I'm living it and it, it really helps get through a little easier when you know exactly what's going on inside you. Uh, have an awesome Saturday, Timmy. Much respect. Oh, Bo, we'll see you later. Enjoy the rest of your evening or whatever time it is, wherever you are. That's another thing with this app. I You know, I haven't gotten used to the time change everywhere. I was talking with Gemma about doing a broadcast with her and it's like five hours difference where she is. So I was saying, Hey, you want to do something at like seven, eight o'clock? She's like, that's one o'clock in the morning. I'm like, Oh, well that won't work. Oh, all right. Uh, and then be there, but not ever bearing for others. Listen, don't dismiss, don't dismiss so easy to, to think we're saying something correct by saying you're not a failure but really that's just dismissing them and yeah it, it's crazy that is all i have folks for this week's installment um next week 
I will be trying to do it from the firehouse. So if it doesn't go off without a hitch, then I'll do something on Sunday. How about that? Um, but in the meantime, keep an eye out for Lucia's broadcasts. Be kind to your mind. Um, our friend Jim in Chicagoland does a great Wednesday night broadcast called Catalyst. Kind of uh, an open conversation while he points the camera at a fire pit. It's pretty awesome. Um, I highly recommend Jim's Catalyst program. Um, and don't forget to tune in to Piano Man tonight at 930 Eastern for the crossword. And I will see you guys on here next week. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Bye.